that's a man with a lot of information, and he his name is always in the paper when it comes to negotiations or lack thereof. He he's been quite involved, and I I think he's going to have a lot of information for us that we don't already read in the paper. Then on the 27th, we have Professor Albert to Alfred Tobias of the Department of International Relations at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And his subject is Israel, the Mediterranean, the European Union. This has been a theme of Professor Shaked for quite a while. I think that if anybody in the government would ask your advice, Chaim, that you will advise Israel that they should orient themselves towards the Mediterranean because the Middle East seems not to be that welcoming to Israel. <laughs> a professor Shaked figured that out a long time ago. Uh, so that's Professor Tobias' subject, and, and that too I think will be very interesting as we see how Israel handles this whole uh, shift in the Middle East. And then we have Professor Kir al Baz, who is a, no, he's not a professor, he's a mister. He's a Bedouin, and he is uh, uh, active as a professional in the Negev Bedouin community, and that's being co-sponsored with our Israel and Overseas Com Committee, on which I serve. So he's going to speak about the Bedouin, in the Negev. they're the ones that keep blowing up the pipeline with, from Egypt. Then we have a new one, March 26th, we have Professor David Nirenberg from the University of Chicago, the Middle Medieval History Meets Geopolitics, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And finally, on April 3rd, and I haven't announced this before, we have a professor who was here, I think last year, right, Kyle? Tudor Parfit? Tudor Parfit on Al-Qaeda, Israel, and Judaism, if there is a nexus. And, uh, He's coming to us from, from England, where he teaches. Okay, so those are the things that are coming up. It's a lot, and uh, I would ask you now, if you haven't done so, to turn your cell phones on to silent. And also that if you don't receive first class mail from the Miller Center or emails and you'd like to, here's a card you can fill out and leave with us. Now, finally, uh, Rabbi Schiff, this morning as I came into my office. I had a little envelope from the office of President Shalala and a note on her stationery to you. Dear Rabbi Schiff, I'm sorry I will not be able to make your talk. Best wishes, Donna Shalala, and this is what she sent for you. Uh, Under, <laughs> uh, I know, I got, that's what I, I immediately wrote her office and said, I said, how can I get one? <laughs> I'm getting one. Oh, you want to change? Will you change? Would you like? To? Okay. And now I want to introduce Professor Chaim Shaked, the inventor of Israel in the Mediterranean, to introduce Rabbi Schiff. Thank you, Maxi. Just a, a word that is uh, not related to the subject. We've all grown up for years with the notion that uh, Israel is standing with its back to the sea and that many, if not most people in the Arab world want to throw Israel into the sea. The, the idea that Maxine was hinting at is that maybe Israel should turn with its back to its neighbor, to its immediate neighborhood, and with its face uh, to the sea. After all, the Mediterranean has not only Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, etc. Uh, on its shores. It also has France and Spain and Portugal and Italy, and uh, they are much more welcoming for Israel than its immediate neighborhood. So, we've been talking here and in Israel about developing perhaps. A, an orientation that would change the concept by which uh, everyone in Israel of my age uh, grew up from before the creation of the State of Israel, and we are beginning to have some lectures on this subject. If you get on our, aid, on our mailing list, we'll be happy uh, to invite you. But that's not the subject of uh, tonight. I think it's becoming for a fan of a football to be uh, incompetent.
competition with basketball. So I hear, I, I know very little about either, so I hear there is a very big basketball uh, game uh, tonight. And um, I, I'm sorry, we, we've tried to avoid competition with sports events and other events, but it, it's simply uh, impossible. And sometimes we schedule an event before we know these dates, so we end up having to compete with these major uh, events. Um, many of you probably remember the movie Munich by Spielberg about terrorism and the Mossad and so on. When the movie was on, someone who knows of my interest in uh, these uh, subjects said to me, what do you think of the movie Munich? And my response was, sorry, I haven't seen it, so I really don't have an opinion. So I said, never mind, you haven't seen it, but what do you think about it? <laughs> I, I have to confess, I have not yet read Rabbi Schiff's book, so I cannot express an opinion, an honest opinion about the book. But I do know uh, Rabbi, um, Chief, I've known him uh, for uh, many, many years since uh, I arrived here. And knowing uh, the person, I can imagine what's uh, in the book. And now that I have a copy, until now I had only advanced uh, uh, publicity, I'm going uh, to uh, read it from uh, cover uh, to cover. But uh, uh, in spite of the fact that I haven't read the book, I had some uh, background uh, information which is normally printed on the back of the books. And I just want to cite a couple of uh, interesting uh, points. First of all, uh, I read on the back of the book that Rabbi Schiff's first uh, pulpit was in uh, Iowa, and uh, that one day a congregant came over to him and said, Rabbi, we didn't know what sin was until you came to town. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that's a very, a, a very wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, Rabbi Schiff has met many uh, luminaries in, uh, his, in his time and had conversations and was awarded uh, medals and, and honors by many important personalities uh, uh, worldwide, known worldwide. He has a doctorate in uh, pastoral uh, consulting from the Hebrew Theological a college, and as you all know, uh, for many years he uh, was the director of the Greater Miami Jewish Federation's chaplaincy and of the Rabbinic uh, Association of Greater Miami. That's where I first met him when I first came here, when the idea of a Miller Center was just a, a, a pipe dream and no one was sure uh, what I was talking about. He was one of the uh, individuals who immediately understood what uh, I was talking about and uh, gave us a tremendous help uh, along uh, the years with spreading the word about uh, uh, our activities. When he retired, as you uh, probably know, he became chair of the uh, Holocaust Memorial uh, on uh, the beach. And that gives us another opportunity to collaborate because the Miller Center and the Memorial uh, do a lot of programming uh, jointly to the benefit of the community and uh, everyone. I'm very, very pleased uh, to welcome uh, Rabbi Schiff. And all I could say, uh, all I can say is that uh, I hope that this is volume one and that you live for many years and be active for many years and that in 20, 30 years you will come here to talk about volume two. I may not be here, but you'll be here. Rabbi Schiff. Since I was given a nice young university, I want to return the gift by giving to my dear friend Chaim Shaked a special yarmulke, which says, under the yarmulke, tales of faith, fun, and football, Rabbi Solomon Ship, www.underthyarmulke.com. <laughs> I'll give you a book later so you can enjoy uh, reading it and see if it fulfills all of the uh, fine comments that you made. Uh, first, let me say I want to thank my dear friend, 
Professor Chaim Shaker, a longtime friend and a rare, tremendous uh, influence on the educational program of our community. I want to thank uh, Maxine Schwartz, a long, long, long time friend, and the Kartzmans, and you've been with us, uh, Maxine, and helped lead missions from many, many Federation missions. I see a lot of friends here, and I don't want to mention each one. Gloria, I must mention you, Charlotte. She has a beautiful, beautiful artwork outside. We'll be here for the dedication. God bless you. Keep doing your wonderful work. Uh, I'm sure there are others I can thank, but I thank all of you, each of you, for coming. Let me say, um, the theme of my book, the, uh, the idea of my book is, the theme of my life, was to bring people together. This was my life's ambition. Whether it's blacks and whites, and I was involved with the civil rights uh, programs, whether it's uh, Christians and Jews, and especially the Catholics, uh, and the Jewish community, I led three interfaith missions to Israel, and I had a papal award from the Pope Benedict. I helped organize a uh, the Pope, late Pope John Paul II, with, who met, wanted to meet with the Jewish leaders of the United States. We'll get into it a little later on. And so that was by bringing together people of different faiths, and also within our Jewish community. There's the Orthodox and Serbian Reform, and often they don't talk to each other. And as the executive director of the rabbinical association, 100 rabbis of the different stripes, my aim was always to bring them together, to find a commonality of all. So this is my theme in life, and this is what I try to portray in the book. Now, I have a whole bunch of different kinds of stories in the book. I have Enochrock stories, grandchildren, I have open stories. You mentioned one of them about the uh, sitting uh, until you came here. I have stories about the dolphins. I was the chaplain, Jewish chaplain of the dolphins for 32 years. I gave a prayer every year, and we'll get into that in a few moments. And also, uh, how are you, Kenny? Also, uh, the involvement with the uh, different elements of the community and with uh, what we'll get into that later. Now, let me just start with something lighter, and we'll get into a little bit more heavy, heavier for a while. People ask me, when did you decide to write a book? So I says, well, over 50 years, I'm in the rabbit, I mean, 60, 63 years. One of my early services that I gave, after the service, a woman comes over to me and says, Rabbi, your sermons are so beautiful, you should have them published. I said, well, maybe someday they'll be published posthumously. So she said, I hope it'll be real soon. <laughs> <coughs> My hope is that she didn't know what the word meant. <laughs> there are a few eight o'clock stories. So one of my eight o'clock says to me, Zadie, how do you remember all your jokes? I said, sweetheart, I have a chip in my head and all my jokes are written on the chip. So he said, so how can I get to learn your jokes? I said, you'll have to get a chip off the old block. <laughs> he said, what does that mean? <laughs> Generation gap. My other angel says, hey, <clears throat> when you were growing up, did you go online? <laughs> I said, honey, when I was growing up, the only thing we had online was laundry. <laughs> they said, what does that mean? <laughs> and another angel said, uh, I also have stories about my prayers in the Senate and the, and the House of Representatives. Well, I was giving a prayer. I gave a prayer, and I said, said it three times in two in the House and one in Florida the legislature. So, the one prayer I was giving in the, in the Senate, we got a whole family together from New York. We have a beautiful picture of all of us with Leon Ross Layton. And as we're going into the Congress building, <clears throat> ready to give the prayer, my husband says to me, Zadie, are you scared? So, this is a moment to teach an uh, Zadie to his angel. I said, sweetheart, if you ever have to give a speech in public, if you practice, you go over what you're gonna say, you'll do just fine. It's okay. I come into the hall, they go up the gallery, standing on the podium, and I have a conversation with the clerk of the house. And she saw my eight o'clock, so we have to talk uh, uh, grandparents, uh, eight o'clock stories. I told her what my angel said about the scared. She says to me, do you know who stood at the place where you're going to give the prayer? I said, no. General Douglas MacArthur, Winston Churchill, Conrad Adenauer, Charles de Gaulle, and every president the last 200 years gave their State of the Union address 
I said, now I'm scared. <clears throat> so I once told this to some people. <clears throat> they said, you know, a future clerk, would you tell us that story, she'll say, and Rabbi Schiff. <laughs> so I thank you very much. By the way, I will just mention, before I forget, that my aim when I said I try to bring people together, one of the things that I always say is that we have diversity in this community like no other community. And I say diversity is not a curse, it's a blessing. And we should be blessed, we're blessed because we have diversity. I never cared for the expression, America's the melting pot. Melting pot to me sounds like you put all the food in the pot, you boil it away, there's no difference, one uniform hash. I look at America and our community as a dinner plate. You have the meat, the potatoes, the vegetables, the green, the yellow, each with its own appearance, each with its own taste, and each its own aroma. Together they make a beautiful appetizing meal. That's what we have. That's why I say diversity is a blessing. Now a few jokes I have, not joke, little stories that I picked up as I made the rounds over the years uh, in the pulpit. So a woman comes over to me once, she says, Rabbi, I loved your sermon. It was short, but brief. <laughs> now, that was the shortest compliment I ever heard. And that reminded me of a t-shirt I once saw, which says, Department of Redundancy Department. <laughs> and then another one <clears throat> comes over to me after my service, she says, Rabbi, the little old lady says, Rabbi, your, your sermon was terrible. Thank you. Rabbi, your sermon was terrible. Well, I felt bad. So a little old man tried to soothe my feelings. He came over and he says, Rabbi, don't take us seriously. She only repeats what others say. <laughs> Again, I, I hope, I think it was meant to be a compliment. Uh, we'll get into a lot of ex a lot of experiences of interfaith, but let me tell you one that sticks in my mind is a very beautiful one. I'm involved in a lot of interfaith panel discussions. So I was part of a panel in a church um, something in the north part of town. And uh, Shirley dropped me off at the place where there was like the Lions Club, had a lunch, and then they had the panel, uh, me, a Catholic priest and present uh, minister. She, as she drove off, I realized I left my jacket in the car. I felt terrible embarrassed. So I go into the, I open the door, I peek in, and say, everybody's wearing jackets and ties. And uh, Reverend J. Calvin Rose, I won't forget his name, across the minister, saw me from the podium, he ran out. So what are you doing, come on in. He says, I feel terrible, I left my jacket. Said, come on with me. Schleps me to the front, we sit that right up on the uh, podium, we have our table. Gets up to the microphone and says, folks, one thing I never liked about this organization, we're too darn formal. I don't know about you, but I'm taking off my jacket if you want to do it. He takes off his jacket, and like in unison, the whole congregation coming in, they all stood up, took off the jacket. They all realized what happened. They saw me walk in without a jacket. I was pretty outstanding. And I write in, in the book, I write that he could never have done a better sermon, but love thy neighbor as thyself better than that experience. So it's something that we learn from our friends, and if they're sensitive, of all faith, of all denominations, they're sensitive. It's uh, very, uh, very helpful. Now, uh, let me talk a moment about uh, my answering service. You know, the answering services, I don't know whether they're answering, they never answer, they don't do any service, but I had an answer for years and years. One day I'm making rounds, seeing people, so people start to needle me. Oh, Rabbi, did you do your Christmas shopping yet? Uh, how are you doing? You're preparing for Christmas. How few people are mentioning that. So I said, okay, let me in on it. What are you, you're trying to tell me something. He said, did you listen to your answering service lately? I said, no, give it a try. I dialed my number and this is what I hear. Merry Christmas, Rabbi Shift service. <laughs> I almost died. I know people know I'm involved in interfaith work, but you know, it's a little too far. Now I gotta get it to stop, but I have to be sensitive, I don't look at a pretty dumb Christmas, you know, it's very sensitive. So I think I'll tell her, you know, during this time of year, people are very busy, they don't find the long messages. Just say, like you always say, Rabbi Schiff's service. Okay, fine. 
I make the rounds and again get an email. Oh, you busy Christmas, Christmas. All right, let me let me get out of it. Call your service. Nicole. Hi, that's Jeffrey. Uh, hi, uh, that's Noah. What my name Who's in the book with some of these stories? Okay. So uh, I'm making rounds, and people again are saying by Christmas. I said, let me know what's happening. She said, call your service. I call my service, and she says, Rabbi Schiff's service, which is good, right? They say, could you have the rabbi call me soon? I have to talk about something very important. She says, oh, Rabbi Schiff is very busy during this Christmas season. <laughs> I say, Chab, you're on board. You know what the next thing? I cancel my service. And, uh, you know, we'll see what can happen without it. Now, uh, our grandson Moshe, he's, he's Noah, the middle one is Moshe, was born October 31st, 19, what was it? 2000 something, whatever. We just about this from last year, huh? 99? 97. He was born October 31st. I come to the office, my office of the Federation. I told one of the secretaries, you know, give me muscle tov. My grandson was born today. So she says to me, are his parents gonna call him their Halloween baby? I never know Halloween is October their race. I said, not a ghost of a chance. <laughs> I told this to our daughter-in-law, and she said, but we do call him our little pumpkin. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, I have stories about my chaplaincy, hospital work. For example, I went to Mount Sinai Hospital, one of the places I served. I come into a patient, and uh, how are you? And he was not Jewish, totally not Jewish. And his, his wife asked me, he said, why are you in this? I said, I have him on the list, the Jewish list. He says, Joseph, why did you say you're Jewish? He said, well, I figured Mount Sinai Hospital would say for to be Jewish. <laughs> I don't know what he thought we were doing him if not Jewish. <laughs> But there's another thing, I went to Jackson Memorial Hospital, one of the places I served. I come into the room, I say, I'm Rabbi Schiff. The patient says, Rabbi, I want to die. Well, when you hear that, you mobilize all your pastoral care training over the years, how to you know, counsel, and I start to walk over to his bed, and I must have been sniffling, and uh, the man said, the patient says, Rabbi, don't come any closer, I don't want to catch your cold. <laughs> <laughs> the man wants to die and doesn't want to catch a cold. So I feel like I can figure he has his choice of how he wants to die. Maybe if I told him I had AIDS, he's come here, let me give you up. I don't know. But anyway, so I don't know what happened to him. Now let me tell you about um, Shirley and I were invited to go to Fiji, the island of Fiji. Uh, you heard of Tony Robbins, anybody here? Tony Robbins, the great motivational speaker. He owns an island called Namali the most beautiful island in the world. He invited us, he had an interfaith world conference on peace. He had 18 heads of different denominations, the whole world from India, from China, all over. And I was chosen as the rabbi, it's a big honor. We went and all paid the trip, it was marvelous. So the first night they had all of us sit line up and each one of us talked about why we came to Fiji. So everybody gives it their reasons, so it came to me. I can't just say I came to Fiji because I wanted to learn. Yeah, that's everybody can say that. I said, the reason I came to Fiji because somebody, you know, somebody asked me, why are you going to Fiji? I said, well, because my favorite apple is Fiji apple. And if I come to Fiji, I'll be able to pack up two or three suitcases with Fiji apples and I'll have to eat the rest of the year. So the guy said, but the name of the apple is not Fiji apple, it's Fuji apple. So let me tell you, I said, let me tell you something. A man won the lottery, and the number he picked was 51. So somebody asked him, how did you happen to pick 51? He said, I have twin daughters. Each one is 26. 26 and 26 is 51. <laughs> so the man says, but 26 and 26 is 52. He said, who won the lottery, you or me? <laughs> so this guy corrected me about the Fuji apple. I said, who is going to Fiji, you or me? And that was, that was a draw. And then I have about this a rabbi that referred to his members as members of the army of God. Nice title to put on them. 
And one day he's walking the street, he saw a member of his who he hasn't seen in shul for a long time. So he says, uh, Moshe, are you still a member of the army of God? He says, yes. He said, how come I didn't see you in shul for a long time? He says, I belong to the secret service. <laughs> There's a section I have called Shirley. One of my sections, I dedicated the book to Shirley. So I tell the story of the first joke I told Shirley on our first date. First joke, first date. Walk out of the house, and I said, do you know how they got the name Staten Island? She said, no. I said, when Columbus was coming across the ocean looking for a place to land, you know it's a clump of trees. He said, Stat an island? <laughs> Stat an island? island. <laughs> so I'm telling you this over the years, we're married in 56 years, I'm telling you all these years. One day Jeffrey, right here, he was like 10 years old, he heard this little story. He said, Mom, you married Dad for that joke? <laughs> she said, he told others that were worse. <laughs> which reminds me of a rabbi that was giving a eulogy, this you about, giving a eulogy to a man who was the worst, no good nick in the world, absolutely the worst. He didn't have not one good thing to say about him. But you give a eulogy, you gotta say something good. So this is what he said. His brother was worse. <laughs> so she said he told jokes that were worse. Now, let me uh, tell you about a couple of little uh, more historical serious uh, notes. I mentioned earlier I've been involved with trying to bring people together in different denominations, different colors. We came to Miami for our honeymoon in 1955, long before any of you were born. Uh, yeah. I'll say it again. <laughs> I'm wrong. I'm off a little. 1955. We took a bus outside of Burdines. Remember Burdines? All of us show them, yeah. yeah. We took a bus to Carl Gabe, a coconut grove for a play. We get on the bus and we see a number of black people standing in the back of the bus holding onto the straps and there are some empty seats in the front. So we go to the people in the back, say, you know, they're at these seats in the front. So they start to laugh. The bus driver calls us up front. I said, where are you from? I said, I'm from New York. She's, she says, she's from Chicago. He says, you're now in the South. Blacks don't sit in the front of the bus in the South. That was our first splash of ice water about this. And then we went to Cranton Park. We saw restrooms that had white, uh, male, black, male, white women. We had more of the fountains white than black. And at that point, I decided to see what I could do to help bring more equality into, the, uh, into our community. And I was involved with, interfaith, uh, with interracial uh, in, in, ever since. So I remember there was a bombing in the Birmingham church where four black children were killed. They had a big demonstration here in Miami. They had a civil rights march. And I walked with the leaders of the black community and I represented the Jewish community. I said, president of the British Association. And I gave a talk expressing our uh, condolences and been ever involved ever since. Uh, a little sidelight about it. The, the, the rabbis who were involved in civil rights marches all wore yarmulkes, like we're wearing. And the blacks identified the yarmulkes as freedom caps. They call freedom caps, they were kind of simple. So they wanted to buy it to wear it, and a lot of people started, the blacks started to wear it. So they found out where they make these freedom caps, these yarmulkes in New York, and the order of 50 dozen, 100, 200 dozen, the guy in New York is this little talus maker. He started to buy all kinds of sewing machines, they're a big business, they're going like crazy, hundreds of thousands of, of uh, black freedom caps. And one time the head of this uh, operation, this uh, little yiddle, calls up the black friend, the customer, he says, can I interest you in some white freedom caps? So it didn't go, so we, we dropped that. Let me tell you about the Pope's meeting with the Jewish leaders. I got a letter from Archbishop uh, Edward McCarthy in the, the 1985 
uh, telling me that the Pope John Paul II is coming to America in 1987, would like to meet with the Jewish leaders of the United States. The letter was not personal and confidential. He wanted me to tell him where the Jewish leaders would welcome a meeting with the Pope. And I did some survey and we were all honored to do it. He called the Pope's office and the meeting's on. I want to tell you that I had tremendous uh, criticism by some of my right-wing uh, Orthodox uh, chevra that I was you know, involved with interfaith work, I'm meeting with a Pope, and I got a lot of faith the night before they uh, picketed my home, and, and so on. But anyway, they asked me, why are you meeting with the Pope? He didn't recognize Israel, he didn't condemn anti-Semitism, he didn't apologize for what the Catholics did not do during the Holocaust to help the Jews. I said, if there's ever a way that he is, will do that, it's not by boycotting him, but by meeting him and discussing with him. So we had the meeting at downtown in the museum, and we had a rabbi we selected, spoke to him publicly, and uh, mentioned these requests to recognize Israel, condemn anti-Semitism, and to issue an apology for not doing enough to save the Jews. Over the years, he did all three. He recognized Israel, he got trapped to Israel, he issued a, a, a statement condemning anti-Semitism, calling it a sin, and also he issued an apology for what they didn't do enough for the Holocaust. What's interesting, in his address, the Pope spoke to us, the leaders, he mentioned two words in Hebrew. One was the Shoah, he didn't refer to it as the Holocaust, he used Shoah, which is our term, and he used the word Teshuvah for repentance, as Sarah can make Teshuvah, 10 days of repentance. Now, why it's important that he use those words is that when you use somebody else's word, it means you try to get into them, you try to have sympathy with them, you're trying to identify with them. And the best example is that when uh, President Kennedy went to Berlin with the wall, he said at the end of his speech, Ich bin ein Berliner was just German from I am a Berliner, but that brought the house down because that again. So that's very important to recognize that he did. And also because I helped bring the Jewish leadership meeting together, uh, uh, Archbishop Favalora, the past Archbishop, uh, sent a memo to uh, the Pope uh, Benedict XVI on the 50th anniversary of this archdiocese and recommending that I get this special medal called the uh, Better Marenti Award, which is a great honor. So let me tell you two things about being in the Catholic Church during the Mass. I'm sitting next to somebody, and they had, during when I was given the award, the, the music and the, the choir was beautiful, outstanding. Somebody sitting next to me says, Rabbi, you know the Catholics sure know how to do pomp and circumstance. And I said, yeah. I said, Rabbi, do the Jews have pomp and circumstance? I said, well, sometimes we have a little pomp depending on the circumstance. <laughs> that was number one. The next thing I learned, the first time I was at a, a mass of the church, they had during their service, where the one that's leading the service turns to the congregation, so I want each of you to bless your neighbor. Very nice. So they turn, uh, this is what they say, uh, the Lord be with you. And then I respond, and with you. And that person says to the next person, back and forth, goes around the aisle into the second aisle, and like the snake is around the whole till it covers the whole church. Somebody turns to me and said, <clears throat> Lord be with you. No, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. So I think for a moment, and I said, and you have a nice day. <laughs> and you have a nice day. So for that moment, the uh, cadence was broken, you know? and it was like stuck because they didn't know how to respond to the other one. The archbishop is looking from his pulpit. On the right, he's seeing it snaking quickly, and the front, he's the third row, it's stuck. And this one, he looks at me, gives me an eye, if it's always I bring as a guest in my church, you screw up my whole service. So I knew from then on, I'd say, I have, don't say have a nice day. Uh, now my, my involvement with the dolphins, Joe Robbie took me on, two, on his plane to two, to two Super Bowl games in 83 and 85. In 85, he took me and Shirley. So on the book, which is called, as you see, the uh, Under the Yama Tales of Faith from the Football, under the Yamaka, and you look at it, are two 
uh, Super Bowl tickets. These were the tickets that he gave to us when he took us on his plane to the Super Bowl. So on 83 on the Super Bowl, I saw him on the plane coming back. He wanted to show me off for his friends. Rabbi Schiff always brings us good luck when he gives the invocation. He said, uh, Rabbi, what's your record with us? I said, 12 and one. We won 12 games and lost one. They were all impressed, 12 and one. So Robbie said, your record with the Dolphins is better than the Dolphins record. <laughs> so then he says, what happened to the one game you lost? Had a thing fast as I'm talking to The way the Dolphins played that day, God himself couldn't help them. <laughs> so if God could help them, uh, uh, who am I? So Robbie was a very sharp guy. He said, I'll tell you, Rabbi, if the Dolphins would have prepared their defense as well as you prepared yours, they would have won. <laughs> Uh, now let me tell you about my meeting Shirley. I told you the, the first joke I told. So Shirley always says, by the way, I was a chazim for as a rabbi, if you didn't know that. And I dove into Shirley's family synagogue in Chicago. That's how we got more acquainted and then the, the rest is history. So Shirley always says about me, I fell in love with his voice before I saw his face. So I guess you can call that Love at first sound. <laughs> Love at first sound. And then I asked her father for her hand. So he said no. He said, if you want her, you have to take all of her. I don't give handouts. So that handout to play on words is like the fella takes a girl to a football game. She never was in a football game. And after the game, somebody says, how'd you like to get with a strange game? Beginning of the game, they throw up a coin, and the whole game, they're all fighting for that coin. Everybody keeps screaming, get the quarterback, get the quarterback. So that was the, that was the, uh, the handout. Now, uh, I have, uh, don't go away. I once got a ticket on US 1 on 57th Avenue. I'm telling you, so you should keep on being careful. That street, the very bad street, you make a, if you make a turn but the, the arrow goes off, you can get a ticket. I got a ticket. So I went to the traffic court in South Miami. You sit there, you know, like a victim waiting for the call your name. You hear different cases. So they call a young man before the judge. And uh, he said, uh, Phil McCann, how do you plead? So the fellow says, it wasn't me. What do you mean it wasn't me? He said, it wasn't, what do you mean it wasn't you? He says, I uh, punched in a clock in my place, nine o'clock, and I punched out at the five o'clock. And the ticket was written 11 o'clock. He could have punched in and out. He could have gone on for a ride, which is what happened. Because the judge looks at the uh, police officer like the new, new. He nodded his head. It was him. So he knows he has a wise guy. So he says, okay, we'll say you have witnesses that you were in your place at that time. He says, yes. He said, we'll set the day, bring your witnesses, and we'll adjudicate. So he turns away and then turns back and says, Your Honor, how many witnesses should I bring? <laughs> now, you know he's a phony because if you're honest, you just bring witnesses. How many with shepherding? So the judge says, young man, let me tell you something. When I was in law school, our law professor once told us, it's possible to have a hundred clergymen, rabbis, priests, and ministers testify one way, and you can have one good witness testify the opposite, and there are times you'll take the, that witness over the hundred clergymen. The point was that numbers don't count, right? Right after they called out Solomon Schiff, they didn't know I was a rabbi. I'm walking up, the blood is rushing to my head. If I got this right, I got something going. So I go up to the front, and the judge says, yes, uh, what is your name? I say, your honor, I'm one of the hundred clergymen that your law professor said, whatever they say, you can't believe them. I'm a rabbi. Busts out laughing. He said, get out of my court, I don't want to see you. <laughs> now, let me tell you, I mentioned about uh, my first, uh, my meeting with Shirley and I thought it was in her father's shul. And if you know anything about baseball, that year, 1954, the World Series was being played 
by the New York Giants and the Cleveland Indians. And everybody in the Midwest was rooting for Cleveland. So Midwest is, is the city. Everybody in Chicago is rooting for Cleveland. The Giants, the, the Giants won three games in a row. You know, the World Series, the best four out of seven. Three games in a row. The fourth game was on Yom Kippur. I'm Davli Musaf, you know, as a chazan. And after a while, the president comes over, whispers in my ear, chazan, Davli Stronger is the fifth inning, the Indians are losing. <laughs> I can't talk, we go on. Comes over, has it the sixth inning. Indians are losing. If they lose, it's all over. I can't talk. Every inning, give me the score and tell me a little stronger, stronger. Finally comes over and he says, uh, Hazen, I'm afraid your prayers are not too good. Game is over, the Indians lost, the Indians lost the World Series. Now I can talk, I just finished Musa. I'll tell you something, I, my prayers are darn good. I am a Giants fan. <laughs> he busts out laughing, he says, son of a gun, if we would have known that, we'd never hire you. <laughs> I heard that since then, whenever they hire an interview with Hazen, the first thing they ask, what kind of baseball fan are you? <laughs> and uh, let me, oh, now let me tell you something which is almost a, a, a piece de resistance. One of the stories I have in here goes back 25, well, about 25 years. In my story, it sits in the book quietly. Something happened, I think about a week or two ago, that took that old story and put a new light on it. Let me tell you what the story is. On page 198, you read the following. In the book, I have a story, in the story form, but I have the documentation, which was too much to put in the book. Let me give you, in short, what it's about. In 1986, I saw a note in a newspaper, in the business section, which says that Colgate, the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the dental the people, Colgate bought a dental company in the Far East, and the name of the toothpaste was called Darkie, D-A-R-K-I-E. And on the cover, it had a picture of Al Jolson, as a minstrel man. You all remember the minstrel man with the black face? At that time it was cute, it was entertaining, but over the years that is a no-no, you know, it's derogatory to the blacks. And I wrote a letter to the president and I said it's a derogatory term and you should change the name. He writes me back, a couple of weeks later I have the documentation, saying that in the Far East they don't know about the blacks or you know, about sensitivity, and they don't see anything wrong in that part of the world. In fact, he writes, that the people in that area associate uh, the uh, black face with white teeth. I don't know why, the black of the face, the, the, the white of the teeth. And he said, thank you very much, and he dismissed my, my letter, my request. Three years later, 1989, I get a letter from Colgate. And the letter said, you have contacted us in the past with Darkie. And he said, we want to tell you, after, after extensive negotiations, we have agreed to change the name from Darkie to Darley. D-A-R-L-I-E, doesn't mean anything. And we remove the black face from the toothpaste. And thank you for bringing it to our attention. And it closed, for your interest, is a press release announcing that we changed it and why we changed it, and he thanked me for bringing it to his attention. So it's a nice warm feeling that you have when you're able to get a company, a national company, be able to make that kind of a change. So there's two things I have in the book I write about, and I said one is never remain silent when you see something wrong, and the, which is what we teach about the Holocaust, and the second thing, never underestimate the power of one voice. I was one voice. I got a chance. So it's a nice story. What happened? About two weeks ago, a man came to our house who heard about the book, he wanted to buy the book, and he read this story about the darky, and he says to me, I bought that product, darky. Where do you get darky? He said, 
I used to travel, I travel to the Far East from time to time, and that was a favorite uh, toothpaste, Darby. And at one time, at one time, they changed the name to Darley. And I don't know why. <laughs> After all these years, he had to come to my house to read my book to learn why they changed the name. Now, what are the chances of somebody that I talk to here in Miami to go to the Orient and be a living witness to my story? Very rare, right? right. Huh? Twelve one. Twelve is very good. Twelve is good. You think that's the end of the story? No. Not yet. <laughs> so let me show you. The next day, this man emails me this. Shirley won a beauty contest. A picture of her in the book, but she won a beauty contest. Shirley won a beauty contest at Herzl Junior College in Chicago, which reminds me of a grandmother I once met who was wheeling her granddaughter down the street. Someone looked at the little one and said, what a beautiful baby. To which the grandmother responded, you should see her pictures. <laughs> I saw both Shirley and her pictures and I love them both. After over a half century of marital bliss, I love them even more. The fact is, what brought us together pales to what keeps us together. And I wanna conclude that it's my hope that under the yarmulke will go over the top in promoting goodwill, understanding, and mutual respect by all of God's children. Thank you, God bless you. Yes. It's a little lengthy if you, uh, if you. Huh? You're here for the night? You're here for the night? Just chill in the audience. I don't have a shift in the audience. I'm often asked what it's like to observe the Shabbos with all its rituals and with all the ceremonies. Is it hard? Is it easy? Is it difficult? So I want to answer that by sharing with you 
some of the rituals of Shabbos. Not so much to tell you how we observe the Shabbos, what's more important to make you acquainted with some of the rituals that may not be known to you. That is, some of them might be known to many of you, and many of them might be known to some of you, but all of them may not be known to all of you, which is something Abe Lincoln might have said if he were Jewish. <laughs> so the Shabbos that I want to share with you is the one in which Shirley and I did time, I mean, spent time in Israel, in the Moriah Hotel in Jerusalem. Now, I must tell you at the outset, that I have difficulty staying in a hotel on Shabbos for one simple reason. I can't sleep with lights on. I can't sleep with lights on. So what happens? Friday we go down to welcome the Shabbos. I turn off the lights, I go down, and the chainmaid comes into the room after we let we leave, and she does the bed. So first, they used to do in the morning, they made your bed, now with progress, they come in a second time to fold down the corner of your blanket. I guess to give you a head start as you slide into bed and you go to sleep. Now if this progress continues, I don't know what she'll do for you next. So I found, so when I come back and the lights are on, I can't sleep. So I found a solution to the problem. I write a note, I put it on the bed, and it says, please leave the lights exactly the way you found them. So she reads the note, when she came in, the lights were off, she reads the note, she closed the light and leaves. This time, I didn't put the note. One, I figured, in Israel, I gotta tell them about Shabbos, it's Israel. Second reason I didn't write the note was I didn't want to think that I'm coming a, a spy with notes and lights and some average spy. And the third reason I didn't write the note was I forgot. <laughs> so we got dressed in our Shabbos finest, we closed the lights, went down, we made Kiddush, we lit, lit candles, we sang Zemiris, and Shabbos Mill, we went for a Shvatsir, a Shabbos walk, and we come back into the hotel, we go up to the room, and you guess the, the lights were up. Not just on, it was like a regular TV studio. It's <laughs> impossible to see. So the only thing I could do is go down and find a non-Jew to uh, close my lights. Now here I must tell you about the ritual, why the Jew is not permitted to open and close the lights, a non-Jew may do that for him. So I went outside, I looked in the hallway, I went up and down Jerusalem, I couldn't find anyone. I gave up, I said, well, uh, if I can't find anybody, I'll try to go to sleep with the lights on. If I sleep, I sleep, and if I don't sleep, we will be sleepless in Jerusalem. So I walked back into the, the lobby, and I opened the door to the staircase. And here I must tell you about the use of the elevator. Some people don't use an elevator. Some use a Shabbos elevator, it goes automatic by itself. I use, prefer, whatever I can, to walk the stairs for a little exercise. I open the door and I go into the lobby, the staircase, and there I see it. A tall, good-looking, blonde hair, blue eyes, must have been a Norwegian, come to work for the summer sweeping the floor, and there was a name tag, Gustav, on his uh, lapel, and I look at him, and I have to make sure he's not Jewish, because to have a Jew do work for you is very not nice. So I walk around him, examining him, make sure I uh, have him pegged. In the meantime, Gustav is getting very nervous. <laughs> would you, how would you like if a total stranger is playing Ring Around the Rosie with him in a dark uh, hallway? Then I decided, we are one, I mean he is one. So I walk over very carefully. Now you have to study another ritual. While a non-Jew could do your work, you're not allowed to ask me to do it. Because if I ask you to do it, it's like I'm doing it. So you have to have him motivated that he wants to do your work on his own. So the, the example of that is, the story of a Jew who had the lights off and he wanted them on. So he goes to the street, he sees a non-Jew, he says to him, you know, I have a wonderful bottle of schnapps, but the lights off, I can't find you. You come into the room, you, you open the light, you'll see it. So he goes into the room, he opens the lights, gives him the schnapps, drinks it. He says, thank you very much. He closes the lights and leaves. <laughs> my problem was I had nothing in my room to entice him to come to the room. All I had in my room was Shirley. I didn't have that's right, man. Out. I mean, 
There's a limit to what I do for my religion. So I go over to him uh, very uh, softly and quietly, and I say to him, uh, the light's on in my room. And he's sweeping away. And I said to him again, the light's on in my room. He said, you're talking to me? I said, yeah. So what do you say? The light's on in my room. He said, so? So I said, so I can't sleep with the light's on. He said, so close it. I said, I can't. He said, why, the switch isn't working? He said, it's working. Your finger isn't working, it's working. So how can you can't close the lights? I can't. He says, I don't understand. If I want to close the lights tomorrow, we just try to switch off. I said, if you're lucky. And then he gives me a, a strange look. He says, why are you telling this to me? I said, I thought you'd like to know. <laughs> he said, I couldn't care less. <laughs> and I believe him. So after a while, I look into his Nordic eyes and, I, and then I see what he's uh, looking at, he's getting at. So, he, so I could see in his eyes he was saying, not in Yiddish, but what he meant was, this guy got this up check. You know, this guy's not going to let me go. I better do something. He said, would you like me to close your lights? I said, if you like. <laughs> if I like. I said, I thought it would be very nice. Okay. Puts down the broom, starts to walk out of the stairway into the lobby. I said, where are you going? Said, we'll go to the elevator. I said, no elevator. <laughs> Why, the button isn't working? It's working. <laughs> Your finger isn't working? It's working. So, so why can't you say, we can't. How about you get up to your room? We'll walk the steps. They're very sturdy. <laughs> How far up are you? It's not very far. So we walk up the eight floors. We arrived on eight floors. And for me, it was very easy. And for him, never. At the zitzing, a krechzing, a zhuzhen. He was panting, panting, breathless. He said to me, how are we able to do this so easy? I said, I practice every Saturday. <laughs> okay, we come into the room, and I said to Shirley, this man wants to close our lights. He says, wants to? I said, would like to. Zip, zip, close the lights. Out of the room. Now, my story would have stopped here, except that in closing the bedroom lights, he also closed the bathroom lights. And just like I need the bedroom lights off, that's why I need the bathroom light on. Not for any religious ritual. Although what I do there, I do religiously. <laughs> but to use a uh, you know, dark bathroom, you could break a leg or worse, I quickly run down the stairs, one down, Gustav, Gustav. When he sees me, he starts to shake. Like, well, here comes the Nacham Ovis again. So I come over to him, I say, uh, the bathroom lights are, I says, what? The bathroom lights are right down there. I thought you'd like to know, I couldn't care less. Would you like me, if you like? Go through the whole thing again, comes up, zip, zip, fix the bathroom, and goes out like a wind, second wind. Now, I never saw Gustav again. I think he quit that very night, <laughs> which is a shame because he is just beginning to get the hang of it. <laughs> and I often wonder what Gustav would tell his people back in Norway about that experience. And I think it would be something like the story they tell about a, a woman, a cleaning woman that worked for a Jewish family, she should tell her friends, those Jewish people have some strange holidays. They have a holiday called Shabbos where they eat in the dining room and they smoke in the bathroom. <laughs> then they have a holiday called Tisha B'Av, where they smoke in the dining room and they eat in the bathroom. <laughs> then they have a holiday called Yom Kippur, where they eat and smoke in the bathroom. <laughs> so if you ask what it's like to observe the Shabbos, depends who you ask. If you ask Gustav, I don't know what he would tell you. But if you ask me, I would say, it's a beautiful day, a day where your body takes a back seat to your soul, and for a few moments, you walk with angels. And I recommend it highly. Thank you. <laughs> That's practice for the mission. Yes, yes, yes. I, I have a very, for me, a very 
serious question. I enjoyed your, your story there tremendous. I think you can give up your day job. But I really, I, I've been an admirer of the, your ability to put together a working entity called the Rabbinic Association, which consists of rabbis, as you said, of all streams. What's been even more amazing to me coming from Israel is that you are neither reformed nor conservative, but orthodox, and you were able to accomplish that over so many years. I, I, I just <clears throat> want to ask you for your thoughts. Why is that impossible in Israel? I think the, the spirit and the foundation of America helps along in what I am involved and many are involved. We have in this country as a feeling of acceptance that diversity, as I said before, is part of our underpinning. We came, the early pilgrims came, they broke away from the denominational problems in, in Europe, and they tried to form a country in which people would accept one another. And I think that's become more prevalent as time goes on. When we go to Israel, the, the polarization, as you say, is very strong. And there are people who would not sit in a room from the Orthodox. I don't have to tell you what's happening with the ultra-Orthodox with spitting on a girl because she went to the wrong type of school. But we don't have that here. There are some extremes all over. And part of the work of the Rabbinical Association is try to bring the different denominations or the stripes, uh, streams of Judaism together. And we learn from each other, and we've learned over the years that there's more that tie us in common than, the, uh, make, than has differences that differentiates us. And if we capitalize on the things that we have in common, then the others will fall away as meaningless because it has no part. I never try to convert anybody in the association. They don't try to convert me. And the fact there are some Orthodox in this community that would not join our biblical association because they don't want to be contaminated. But, you know, everybody, it's a free country. So, but mostly the rabbis here have very strong unity. Now, by the way, uh, I mentioned about interfaith. I led three interfaith missions to Israel. On this last one in 2000, I had three archbishops, Archbishop Favalora, Archbishop McCarthy, Archbishop Favalora, and Archbishop Wensky, who then was a bishop, now he's the Archbishop. And the understanding that we try to promote, the people there ask, how do you, how do you rabbi, how do you go with, uh, you know, with, with, with priests, with archbishops? And I say, we have a lot to learn from each other. And only if I give respect to them, will I get respect. I'll quote something from Pierre Gervais, which I know you're very familiar with. The story of a rabbi, uh, a man came to the rabbi and said, Rabbi, the one that wrote Pirkei Avot, The Ethics of the Fathers, was not telling the truth. Why? There's a verse in The Ethics of the Fathers which says, Kol habarech achara kovot, and kovot barech mimeno. One who runs after kovot, the kovot runs away from him. It also says someplace else, Kol habarech mina kovot, and kovot barech achara. The one who runs away from kovot, the covenant pursues him. All right, makes sense. So this man comes to the rabbi and says, you know, the one that wrote that was not telling the truth. Why? Because I've been running away from covenant, and the covenant doesn't run after me. So the rabbi, what? Oh, covenant is honor. I, you know, the covenant honor. I've been running away from covenant from honor, and the honor doesn't run after me. So the rabbi said, yes, you run away from the covenant. But you keep looking back to see if the covenant is following. That's not called running away from covenant. And so we say, well, we try to be an example when we run up these missions to show them that when you respect others, you gain respect. I gain more respect by the fact that we said in the fact, tell you something, uh, let me finish the sentence and I'll tell you an example. They, I gain more respect by staying with, firm in my beliefs, and I gain more respect from the others. A lot of people try to compromise, right? I don't compromise, and I gave I gave an example. Archbishop uh, Favalora, a couple of years ago, had a uh, all-day seminar for clergy. A hundred clergy, hundred clergy, all the denominations, had a uh, all-day seminar. 
the council lunch. I asked the archbishop, Archbishop, do you have anything here that I could eat? He knows I'm kosher. So what are you talking about? You can eat everything here. I ordered all the food from Sarah's kosher pizza store. I was the only Jew, the only rabbi, and he ordered for all hundred. So I went back to the office and told Jacob, solve the story. He says, Alavai, our Jewish agencies should be that sensitive to make sure they take care. So the point I'm making is that when we show respect for others, we gain respect. If I say I'm better than you and you don't count, I'm not going to gain you respect. Matter of fact, as I told you when they were picketing me for the meeting with the Pope, and they said, no, he didn't do this. And I said, is any time, the way he could do it is he showed you could meet him and ready to talk. So our, the, our foundation is we talk to each other, and that's how we gain respect. And uh, another thing that I have in my, that I developed by open with the thinking is that, uh, you know, in America, I mentioned about the, uh, the melting pot, which I don't care for. There's another expression, which is live and let live. You all have the expression live and let live. It sounds nice, right? Live and let live. I live, you live. We each has a right to live. I never cared for that. Live and let live is good. If I'm okay, I have a roof over my head, I have enough to eat, and I have enough to uh, take care of my family, fine, you have, fine, we're both happy. Suppose I have all these things and you don't. Suppose you're homeless, suppose you're hungry. Live and let live means, if I have, I'm okay, you don't have, it's your tough luck. I say the philosophy should be, and the Jewish philosophy is not live and let live, but live and help live. Live and help live. And that way we can all enjoy the benefits of God's creation to be able to enjoy life. So I hope some way we'll be able to spread the word. Yes, no, I didn't even think. Um, why, did, why did you want to start helping black people? When, like, they wanted to go out and sell buses? Oh, good question. Why I decided to help black people and they weren't on the bus? Let me ask you a question before I answer it. If somebody What's your favorite color? Pick any color. Orange. Orange. If you have a friend that wore a blue shirt and you wear orange, would that keep you from talking to him because you wore a different color than you? You still, you still talk to him? Right. Because the color doesn't matter, right? And the same thing here. We're all God's children. God made everybody. Everybody's different. But yet, we're all part of one family, and in a family we respect each other, no matter the differences. And when the black is persecuted, and they can't sit in the front, that's something that's hurtful not only to them, it's hurtful to me. Because I'm, if I'm part of a society that allows this kind of hatred, then I'm partially to blame. That's why my philosophy has always been, when you see something is wrong, stand up and be counted. And I'll give you an example of practical everyday life. When you hear a friend telling a joke that makes fun of others, blacks or, uh, or, or, or Chinese or, or, or Jews or Christians, so what most people will do, they'll smile. They'll not be happy with that uh, derogatory joke. They don't want to stand out, so they smile and let it go. But if you want to do what's right, say it in a nice way. You know, it's not very nice to tell that kind of joke. I assure you, if you did that and one or two other people do that, that person wouldn't uh, tell that joke again. And we had that experience. We were at, uh, on the beach. They had a, uh, a kosher restaurant and they had food on, on the Lincoln Road. They had tables outside. And we're sitting at a table. And the next table, somebody lit up a cigarette. So it happened a few months ago. Lit up a cigarette. I went over to the guy with a cigarette. I said, you know, would you mind not smoking? Oh, I'm sorry. Put out the cigarette. Now, take that scene, go back 20 years ago, 30 years ago, repeat that scene. I go over to the guy and tell him about the cigarette. What do you think the guy would say, or what he would do? You know where he told me to go, right? You yeah, tell me where to go, right? Now, he did it. He could have said, I'm out the open air, or all kinds of Because we keep talking making cigarette smoking so terrible. And the television is constantly bombarding people about the ban of cigarette. That became unpopular, unpopular. 
there was a guy, Duke, remember Duke ran for office? He was a hater of the Jews, everybody else? David Duke. David Duke. They just kicked him out. He couldn't get anywhere. 50, 75 years ago, he'd be popular. Because if we keep saying it's wrong to say bad things, eventually people will learn. Thank you for the question. Young man. Uh, your Staten Island story reminded me, do you know that Jews named a very important city in California? In the early 1700s, a Jewish family in a Conestoga wagon was headed westward, and as they crossed over the Sierra Nevada mountains and they looked at this beautiful view of the Pacific and the land, they had knives, they had knives. Ah. <laughs> good. good, 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 good. Good, good. <laughs> Very good joke. Good, good, good. So, come buy the book, Rabbi Schiff will sign it for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Pay me and tell me what you want to write in it. Right. Very sure. Nice. You have a paper, write down the names. I have a paper. So, write down the names, everybody. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity of being here and being able to share my stories with you.